All right, you guys ready? You ready to jump in? Let's jump in quick. Okay? First of all, if God spoke stuff to you during the service and during our times, make sure you write that stuff down. It's always good to remember. I can't tell you how many times I've needed in seasons to go back to words that have been spoken over me to get encouragement. How many of you have noticed that? Anyone ever done that before? Nobody? Okay, cool. Oh, a couple. Okay. All right, good. But it's always good to keep your prophetic words with you, especially the ones that stick out to you the most, and keep them in like, try to put them all together in one spot. It's amazing what happens when you read them all at the same time. When I was out at, when I was out at Bethel, um, you, we used to get prophetic words like all the time because they have a very strong prophetic culture and people would just... So it was my favorite thing about their culture was just how often random people would just come and give you a prophetic word and it would just encourage what you were going through. Like God was... And it's the thing that I love about prophet, true prophecy is it's kind of like God saying, I see you and I care and I'm here. Amen? And that's what I love about it. And um, I'm, what? I remember I was praying and asking the Lord for a season, for you know, a breakthrough, and for a greater encounter with him. And one guy just came up to me. He's like, man, this is kind of weird. But, and I've never seen the guy before. He's like, it's kind of weird, but I just saw you. And it's like I heard one thing. God says, keep praying for what you're praying for because he's going to answer it soon. Like those, that's a simple word, but it means so much when you're like going for something, right? And then I remember another time where I, when I was struggling with, um, kind of struggling with my calling and struggling with my identity and kind of feeling like my life, you know, you kind of, anyone ever notice you kind of do this in life a little bit? And it's like if you start giving any ear to the enemy's lies, you, you're done one of these. Right? And you give a little bit of an ear, and then he's like, and all of a sudden he's, he's like wide open, and you can go down the rabbit hole pretty quickly with lies by believing lies about who you are and stuff. And um, I remember I was kind of in one of those going down seasons. I was listening to, you're not accomplishing anything. You're not going to, you know, these dreams of yours, blah, 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 aren't going to happen. How many of you ever had those kind of things? Yeah. And I was kind of listening to those way too much. And I remember this guy just came up to me at Bethel one time and he said, right when I was going through that, he said, he goes, I just see like a Coke can. And you know, like if you shake up a Coke can and you open up the top, it just like blows out the top. Well, you, I saw you differently. It's like God was a double barreled shotgun and you were the Coke can sitting right on top of the shotgun. <laughs> and it just was like, boom. And he's like, God just said, that's the level of your breakthrough that's coming. And I was like, oh, I mean, it's like so encouraging to hear those things. Because it was perfect timing. Imagine that. So anyway, always treasure those words and keep them in front of you. All right, I'm going to talk about something real quick here, but we're going to read in 2 Peter 1 first. Um, I'm going to battle. I'm going to go after something that's been in our church cult, not in our church, specific church culture, but in um, charismatic church culture for a little while. And um, I want to bring a balance to it. Okay? All right. Starting in verse 3. Well, first in verse 2, Peter says, grace and peace be multiplied to you um, in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Grace and peace is multiplied as you get to know God and Jesus more. And then this part, seeing that his divine power has granted to us. All right, before I keep reading, these are one of those verses that are so good, like, all, like the too good to be true kind of verses. Like the verse in John chapter 15 and 16 where it's, and John 17 where Jesus just says these radical statements about what's available to us. It's hard to understand where he pretty much says, hey, everything that Father God has, he's given to me, and I am going to tell the Holy Spirit those things, and so you have access to all of God. Like, where's the limit there of what's available? Like, the, those kind of verses, and we tend with those verses, we tend to read them and be like, oh, cool. 
and keep reading without thinking like the weightiness of what that actually means for us as a new believer. Like, oh, Jesus is going to make known to me everything possible that the Spirit of God dwells inside of me, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and I can know the deep things of God because His Spirit lives inside of me? That's crazy. So these are, this is one of those verses. Seeing that God the Father, His is God the Father, um, has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Through the true knowledge... And that word, true knowledge, is um, gnosis, epinosis, just means like accurate knowledge. The true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. And that word excellence, it, it's arete, I think, in the Greek. It means moral excellence. And I think it's translated, if you have New King James, moral excellence. Um, but... He called us by his own glory and moral excellence. For by these, what's these? So when you think about it, when you read scripture, like what's he mean by these? By his own glory and excellence. By his own glory and excellence are these. He has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. That's, this is crazy two verses. Crazy. Now, keep reading. So he switches gears here. Now for, and this is what I want you to see. And then he says, now for this re very reason also. What reason? The reason of verses three and four. The reason of now that God has done all of this, now do this is what he's saying. Because of what God has done, Apply all diligence in your faith. Supply moral excellence. That word moral excellence is the same as his glory and excellence in verse 3. It's orete. Supply moral excellence and in your moral excellence, knowledge. And in your, which comes first, moral excellence or knowledge? Let's find that interesting. Living in faith and who you are as an identity will bring knowledge. Some of us see our world, we all say, if you want to grow, you have to get gain in knowledge. And God's like, no, just obey me with blind faith, and then knowledge will come. <laughs> all right. So, and in your knowledge, self-control. And in your self-control, perseverance. And in your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours... And that word qualities actually isn't in the Greek, but it makes more sense as you read it in English. Because he says, for if these are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you want your lives to be unfruitful and useless? <laughs> Nobody, right? I was born to be useless. Let's no one has that innate thing in them. That's only something that the world brings in through pain and hurt. For he who lacks these qualities is blind and short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Hmm. Yeah. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and his choosing of you. For as long as you practice these things, key, 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 you will never. How cool is that? That's so, good. so people who preach that you have a sin nature and that you're always going to sin, they haven't read that verse. Because right here it says there is a possibility that I can never stumble. Yep. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. So here's, here's where I'm going to go with this. We have this kind of statement, and it's in worship songs, and, I, and trust me, like I get like the heart behind it. A lot of the time, I actually think it's accurate before I tell you what this is. I think it's accurate, but it can be taken wrongly and gone in the wrong direction by millennials. Um, yeah. 
I'm technically a millennial. I'm the very beginning of millennialhood. And I'm in rebellion of it. Because I've always, like growing up, I always thought, like, I had never heard of millennial until I was an adult. It's like, I was Generation X. And then I found out, I looked it up, and like, I think millennial started in 1980. Like, anyway, I was born in 81. So anyway, we have a lot of stuff going on in generations. What, what is after millennials? Z? Gen Z? And then what's after them? It's the end of the... We got to start over. <laughs> All right, so... Gen Alpha. Gen Alpha? Really? I want to be Alpha. That sounds cool. All right. Yeah. All right, so... The thing I want to go after here is the idea of striving. Because we have all these, we have songs that say there's no striving, we don't have to strive, right? We have these kind of concepts going on. And one of the weaknesses of that, that I believe, is that there's this idea that people in our generations, they want all of the benefits with none of the perseverance. It's like the idea of even coming up to somebody like, I mean, I've had people come up to me and say these things, and I'm not saying they always have the wrong heart, hear me, but the idea of like coming up and saying, will you pray that I get your double portion? It's like, I can't impart my history with God to you. Now, we get that from um, Elijah and Elisha, right? Right? Are you willing to serve like Elisha served Elijah? (laughs) Right? He's the one who got to ask. No one else got to ask that. It wasn't just some rando coming up to him and being like, hey, Elijah, you're pretty cool. See you walk in power. I'd like to do that. (laughs) Call him fire down and all. (laughs) pretty cool. Sign me up. I want people to shake when I walk by. I want bears to come out of the woods. No. All right. So, like, there's this concept, like, hey, I want your double portion. And it's like, where's that coming from? Right? It's coming from this, I, I think I can get everything and not have to put any hard work in. Right? I think I can gain, like me going up to someone like Heidi Baker and saying, I want your double portion, Heidi. She's like, you know how many hours I've spent on my face before the Lord? Do you know how many times I've prayed for dead babies and they didn't raise from the dead? Do you know how many times I've been begging and crying out to the Lord in the wee hours of the night? Have you done that? Have you been seeking the Lord? Because he is a, re- he is a rewarder of those who... All right, so here's the thing. God was teaching me something. He said, striving is not the issue. Because if you strive without identity, you're wrong. And if you have identity without striving, you're wrong. They're both wrong. And so because we've maybe seen our parents or seen the generations before us get raised in this like striving mentality or just going after stuff and law-based mentality, which that is striving without identity. And so now identity is a big thing. So we try to keep our identity, but then we think we're going to get everything and we don't have to work for anything. And we end up being entitled and we don't learn how to serve with the king's heart and servant's hands. You hear me, church? And I'm telling you, I started thinking about this as God was sharing with me. He said, it's not, striving is not the problem. This problem is what you're striving from. It's the, it's the existence of what you're going from. And most of my life, I have been, I've been striving without true identity. And striving without true identity, like, here's the thing. All right, right here, verses three and four. I want to read it one more time. And it says, 
seeing that God's divine power, we can stop right here. Seeing, I told you I was going to be quick, I'm sorry. Seeing that God's divine power, seeing that his divine dunamis power, the dynamite power of God is behind this. has given, granted to us, granted means because of your position as sonship, you get it, okay? It's granted to his sons. That's, you, you are not an heir as a slave. You're an heir as a son. And so things begin to be granted to you because of your place of sonship, all right? And so in this, he has granted to us, say he has granted to me, everything, in the realm of life and godliness. Through the true knowledge of Jesus, who called us by his own glory and his own moral excellence. Arete. All right? And by these, by his own glory and his own, what's another way to say moral excellence? Righteousness. Right, so by his own glory and his own righteousness, he has granted to us his precious and magnificent, that word magnificent means great, beyond measure, promises, so that by them I can become a partaker of the divine nature. having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. This is your identity. And then he goes right here, now for this very reason, verse five, applying all diligence. You know what that word all diligence can also mean if you look it up? Striving. (laughs) Striving for something earnestly, another way to say it when I looked it up, is earnestly pursuing something. With all you are going for something. That's what striving is. Now, you either strive to try to be something or you strive from being something. One leads to feeling like a hamster in a wheel, going nowhere, and one leads to fruit beyond measure and joy, peace, and hope. The whole trip, even in prison, even getting beaten, even getting suffering, you still have the joy and hope and all of that from the Lord. Amen? And this is what God is showing me. It's like, because I started thinking about it. Like, there's not one person I greatly respect in history of the gospel who's been doing healings and doing these things that didn't strive for it that didn't have a ton that they had to lay down on the line, that didn't sacrifice their own lives in many ways to get what they were carrying. There's not one person. Not one person woke up one day and said, I think I'm going to be a healing evangelist today. (laughs) Right? Like they pursued it. I've read John G. Lake's whole story. The guy was pursuing it and pursuing it and pursuing it. And then he got encountered by the Lord, and he was not seeing a whole lot of uh, breakthrough, and then he got this encounter from the Lord, and all of a sudden, people started getting healed. Amen? And he made mistakes. But the Lord was just showing me in this whole thing, it's, it's learning. It's like when you strive without identity, you will strive for the things that only I can give you in faith. And those are things that you can never get on your own. That's why you feel like a hamster on the wheel. That's why you feel like you're getting burnt out. That's why you feel like I can't go for this anymore because you actually will never get it. Is that making sense? I can't be righteous without the gift of Jesus' righteousness. I can't get it. I can't gain that, no matter how hard I try. I can't, and the Lord, like, this is kind of scary, but it's like, I actually can't work on my own sin and try to deal with it and ever win. 
I have to step into the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus as a gift and say, this is who I am. Now I'm going to move from this place and watch the sin just dwindle away. And then I'm striving after these things. I'm striving after moral excellence. I'm striving after uh, knowledge of self-control because I am his son and his divine nature is already in me. I'm not striving to get divine nature. He already gave it to me. I'm not striving to get godliness. He already gave it to me. It's making sense. I'm not striving to be dead from sin because he already conquered it. And it's, there's just certain things, and I feel like it's like you come into this place of, it, it takes crazy humility to step into this faith. Because I can't say, I mean, it's what Paul said, it's with faith so that nobody can boast. No one gets to say, hey, look how good my life is compared to yours. Look what I accomplished with my own power. <laughs> like nobody gets to do that <laughs> nobody gets to do that and God says Justin I'm asking you to strive after the things of from who I made you to be and when you strive knowing you're righteous, when you strive knowing you're a son, when you strive knowing that you have everything needed to live in a godliness, you will strive with joy. You will strive with passion. You will strive with hope. And we can change the word if striving is too hard for your semantical thing. If you earnestly go after these things. Like we could use that word. They mean the same thing though. What Olympic athlete got to the, where they were without striving? Nobody. No one wakes up and goes, oh, I'm pretty athletic. I think I'm going to get a gold medal today. I think I'm going to start swimming. <laughs> right? They would get their butts kicked without tons of practice, tons of hours. And, I, like, hear me. You don't have to strive to be, it's not hard to strive being a good husband if you're in love. Right? If you are in love with that person, the things that you do to increase in intimacy in the relationship are a joy. And it's the same with the Lord. When you're in love with God, when you see who he's, the position he's given you because of what his son did for us. This is the gospel message. It's you could never fix yourself, so I did it. I came up with a way so that you could come and be my temple of the Holy Spirit and I could indwell you again. And make you a new creation and give you the new heart that I've been wanting to give you. And I just realized, I started thinking about my life, and I realized the times of greatest breakthrough that I've had is just saying yes to what God has already said. And believing it. The times of greatest breakthrough when I've prayed for people is when, I'm, when I've sensed and just known, like, I am doing this because I'm a son. When we were, you know, many times when I've prayed for healing and had longer lines of people waiting on me to pray for them, like when I was in Africa and stuff like that, you get these long lines of people um, when we were on some, some missionary teams. And, and you start feeling like the weightiness of like, oh, man, I better. You start feeling that performance side kick in. Like, oh, man, I hope I better work up this prayer. Right? <laughs> and you start feeling like, oh, I hope something happens. They're gonna, I'm going to have an empty line soon. Things don't start happening. <laughs> but you can start feeling the pressure because like, all these people are coming with these great needs. And you're like, ah. And then I just remember God saying to me, he's like, Justin, you get to do this because you're my son. I'm the healer. 
So whenever I would start feeling that pressure to perform or that pressure to I have to do something, it's like, oh, no, I don't. I'm a son. I'm a son. Jesus, you're the healer. I just, however you want to move through me, I say yes. And people start getting healed. And that's like, that's when I have seen the greatest breakthrough. When I feel like I'm having to muster up something, I usually don't see any breakthrough. You guys hear me? All right. And I think one of the issues in Scripture, how many of you know the issue? We got Paul and James. You guys know that dichotomy, seemingly dichotomy, which is Paul says you're saved by faith, not by works. And then James says, well, your faith is useless without works. Right? So we have this thing that seems like they're going against each other, but in actuality, Paul's trying to get you to go from a place of sonship And then James is trying to take sons and get them not to be entitled and do something with their faith. Right? You hear me, church? And so I just want to encourage you with that. I'm going to stop there. And just remember, it's not the striving that is the problem. or It's what you are striving from. And you'll feel the fruit of it. You'll feel the fruit of it in your life. Do you feel like a hamster on a wheel, just stressed out, running in circles, not really going anywhere? Life is so crazy and busy, right? Church, what am I doing? And whenever I've gotten into these places, you know what the Lord always takes me to? He brings my family in my mind. He brings my children to mind. He's like, Justin, if you keep striving to try to gain what I've already given you, you're going to miss all of the really valuable things in your life. So let us begin to strive from our true identities, not to try to gain identity. Stand up with me. Is that making sense to you guys? You with? All right. So just put your hand on your hearts this morning. Jesus, we just thank you for being here. We thank you for your presence in this house. We thank you for what you have done. It's set in stone. You are the cornerstone. Nothing can move it. You are the foundation of our house. And so we say yes to being sons and daughters. Everyone just, wherever you're at, just say, I'm a daughter, I'm a son. Just say it. I am, and therefore, an heir of God's divine nature. I die again to self-reliance. And step into faith in Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, come. Come. Only you can give us a new heart. It's funny. I just keep getting this picture that people are trying to fight the enemy so hard and God just says, just come in my lap. Just come in my lap. The enemy can't even be around me. Jesus, may we position ourselves in what the gospel preaches. Christ in us, the hope of glory. That we are no longer slaves of sin. But 
we are slaves of righteousness. Ha. Thank you, Jesus. I just thank you that I pray, Father, right now that we would learn to strive and, the, and go for things because of who we are, not to gain what you have already accomplished. We pray for the humility to accept what you have done and to receive the justice of our Savior, the redemption of our souls. Everyone said, amen.